Low testosterone continues to remain a hot topic and is a common issue for men, especially as they get older. New findings from a recent study, which was the largest of its kind, reveal what men can do to reduce the likelihood of low testosterone levels. And spoiler alert, it is not medication or supplements. We have one of the primary investigators of the study here today to chat with us, so you don't want to miss out. So the big question is this, how can men and those who care for them better educate themselves regarding prostate health, the conditions that affect the prostate, and the latest technology in managing these conditions? That is the question, and this podcast will provide the answers. On a weekly basis, we'll be chatting with experts, innovators, and leaders in the field of urology, sharing useful information with the general public to improve their lives and increase their overall health. My name is Dr. Garrett Pullman, and welcome to the Prostate Health Podcast. Prostate Health Podcast is for informational purposes only. Nothing in this podcast should be construed as medical advice. By listening to the podcast, no physician-patient relationship has been formed. For more information and counseling, you must contact your personal physician or urologist with questions about your unique situation. I am very happy to be able to introduce Dr. Jake Fantis to our Prostate Health Podcast listeners. Dr. Fantis is definitely one of the rising stars in urology, particularly when it comes to men's health. He is currently at Northwestern University in Chicago, where he is undergoing additional subspecialty fellowship training in andrology to really further enhance his expertise in the management of medical and surgical management of male, sexual, endocrine, and reproductive health. He completed his urology residency at the University of Chicago and medical school at Baylor. He has been continually devoted to advancing our knowledge of low testosterone in men and how to improve a man's testosterone with behavior modification. Dr. Fantis, welcome to the Prostate Health Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Now, I thought our listeners may appreciate this. Kind of a funny story. So for many of the guests on the, my show, who I don't already have personal contact with, I'll first reach out via email to invite them on the show. And after hearing your recent talk at the 2020 American Urologic Association meeting, which was virtual this year, I thought you would perfect for the show. So after sending off the invitation to you, which I thought was the correct email, I get this response. I think you are looking for my son. I will forward. Have a nice day from Dr. Richard J. Fantis, professor and chair Medical Director of Trauma and Surgical Services at the University of Illinois College of Medicine at Chicago. <laughs> yeah, uh, funny story. So my dad decided to give me the same name with a different middle name. So we're both Richard J. Fannis, hence the Jake, which I've gone by my entire life. And as you can imagine, that's caused a lot of trouble in my life, especially with medical licensure. So as soon as I applied for an Illinois uh, medical license, he immediately got a piece of snail mail that said his has been revoked since I had listed my address as my permanent address, which was his at the time. That's really funny. You know, and, and to be honest, when I reviewed your talk and when it was also quoted in the Urology Times, you know, it had listed you from the University of Chicago. So it didn't completely throw me off at first when I apparently found your dad's contact info. But I was a bit curious to find out, you know, how a trauma surgeon became so interested in low testosterone in men. But Again, little did I know that there was a father and son, Richard J. Fantis, MD. <laughs> so, Dr. Fantis, now, before we get into the findings of your recent research study, I wanted to just step back for our listeners and just cover a few details first on male testosterone, starting with, what is testosterone? So, uh, in simple terms, testosterone is uh, just the basic male hormone that, you know, makes us men. It, it derives sexual differentiation or makes a body from a female, which is what everyone starts out as, to a male, both externally as well as, you know, developing the gonads. And then more than that, testosterone has a, a lot of functions in the human body. We, we call it a fairly ubiquitous hormone or something that regulates, you know, tons of functions, things from muscle growth to, you know, decreasing fat to how many red blood cells you have, to the density of your bones. I mean, it's a fairly important hormone on, on multiple levels. So how common is low testosterone? It's kind of a tough question to answer. There have been a number of epidemiological surveys that have tried to answer this question. And uh, the best answer I can give you is that it increases by age and that, you know, recent series would uh, estimate that it's, you know, 50 to 60% of all men by their 80s. So it's, it's quite common to have low levels of testosterone based on our recent guidelines. I think one caveat with that is, you know, low testosterone itself isn't necessarily bad. 
a number of people don't have any symptoms whatsoever. And something that's important to us as urologists is how many people have symptoms or have something called testosterone deficiency, which is just symptoms of low testosterone and levels of low testosterone. And that number is a lot lower. That number is more on par with four to five million uh, people in the United States per year. So you mentioned some of the potential, you know, the symptoms that may arise. What are some of those potentially uh, symptoms or signs that a man may know that his testosterone might be low? Yeah, test, as I said, since it's such a, a uh, common hormone that has so many functions, it can be t- quite difficult to figure out what is causing uh, a man's symptoms. Testosterone has a number of roles, as I mentioned, and symptoms are fairly nonspecific. Things like fatigue, decreases in memory, decreases in you know, and energy decreases in lean muscle mass, troubles at the gym, actually increases in obesity. And then there are things that are, again, specific to urologists like erectile dysfunction and uh, decreased libido or sexual desire. And then there are sometimes rare symptoms like breast development or something we call gynecomastia. So are there any risks associated with having a low testosterone level? That's another fairly difficult question to answer, but yes, I mean, there are some postulated risks. Some people with low testosterone have, again, lower red blood cell counts or anemia, decreased bone mineral density or likelihood to have a fracture, increased risks of other comorbidities like diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. And then there are fairly good series showing that there is an increased risk of things like cardiovascular mortality, stroke, and even all-cause mortality. Yeah. Wow. So before we kind of get into this study, you know, lastly, you know, for our listeners, what are some of the more common treatments for low testosterone if, you know, the urologist or, or you know, provider decide it is necessary to get this started? Well, outside of any of the lifestyle changes that, you know, are near and dear to my heart, there are a number of ways to replace testosterone. The uh, most simple is to actually give an analog of the hormone itself. That ranges from things like an injection that you get every week to two weeks to three weeks, a gel that you put on every day. You know, they even have a nasal spray out now or a nasal gel that you take twice a day. There are some pills, though I caution any of the listeners, the only one that's approved for this is something called Jitenzo, which is actually a testosterone supplement. All the other types of oral supplements are pro-hormones and can be dangerous. But then a little bit more of a nuanced answer to that is that there are other medications that we commonly give people to raise their own body's production of testosterone. And that's important because when you give somebody exogenous or artificial testosterone, it shuts down their natural production. And in doing so can have serious repercussions with their fertility. So giving these medications like Clomid, which is clomiphene citrate or HCG, another type of injection, can not only increase a man's natural levels of testosterone, we can also keep them fertile during this. Yeah, and that's a really important point that you brought up in terms of, especially for men still concerned about their infertility, that that can certainly be affected by taking that, uh, you know, the testosterone supplementation. So I think it'd be safe to say that there are not many men out there that just love taking medication. Mm-hmm. Many of the testosterone uh, prescription medications can be quite costly. And as with any medication, have potential for side effects. I think our listeners are very interested to hear more about the results from the study that you presented at the American Urologic Association meeting. And now you are looking at a behavioral change that men can implement that may reduce the likelihood of low testosterone. So can you tell our audience which behavioral change you looked at and maybe some background, including, you know, what prompted the interest in looking at this? Yeah, so, uh, you know, as far as uh, background, during my uh, during college and during medical school, I actually was a licensed personal trainer, which not only prompted me to be interested in lifestyle modifications, but again, through all these complex interactions, actually urology as well. And my most recent study at the American Urological Association's meeting was in uh, exercise and its effects on modulating testosterone. And the previous meeting the year before, I actually looked at different types of diets on testosterone, common diets like the low-fat diet and the Mediterranean diet. But to kind of focus a little bit more on the exercise component of this, you know, one of the things that I and a lot of clinicians find frustrating is that you offer a patient advice to eat better or exercise more and you'll be healthier. And while that's true for a number of conditions, you know, the dogma that exercise is good for every single condition isn't true. And I set out to actually look at different individuals and if their exercise levels correlated with whether or not they had low levels of testosterone. And my hypothesis was that men who exercise more, regardless of BMI or 
other comorbidities that they have, like high blood pressure or high cholesterol, would be more likely to have a normal testosterone. So what you set out to see if men at these higher levels of activity, you know, are at a decreased likelihood of low testosterone levels. Now, what did you ultimately find with your results? So using the uh, Physical Activity Guideline Advisory Committee or the PAGIC, which is a group that's sponsored by the um, Secretary of Health and Human Resources by our government, uh, they set forth these guidelines of how much the, a person needs to exercise, which is about 500 to 1,000 metabolic minutes per week. And what we found is that people who exceeded this minimum recommendation, that they were less likely to have low testosterone than people that didn't make the recommendation, meaning people with over 1,000 metabolic minutes per week were far less likely to have low testosterone than those less than 500. And then because, again, weight is so important, and there have been numerous studies showing that weight loss itself decreases the risk of having low testosterone. We looked at this in the obese category, and even in the obese category, so independent of weight loss, men were less likely to have low testosterone exercising at the highest level. Well, that definitely, you know, it can be very impactful. Now, you know, that information that we can now provide to our patients as we counsel them on exercise and, and weight loss for sure. Now, uh, so to clarify in your results, you had mentioned meeting the goal MET minutes per week. For our listeners, what does that look like in trying to meet that? Yeah, so the Padgett has done a few things to try to make this a little bit easier for the layman to kind of understand what they need to do. And that would be between 150 to 300 minutes of moderate exercise or 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous exercise a week. But even that can be somewhat nuanced. So I thought I'd give you a few examples of what a MET was and how this can impact your life. That'd be great. So so just the uh, most things we count and most things that have been studied, and again, this committee sits down and reviews all the literature, are moderate or vigorous activities. So anything that's sedentary or light activity, while they do use METs or basically a metabolic equivalent, which is just the amount of oxygen you consume. So one MET would be just sitting at rest. Anything that's not moderate or vigorous is not counted. And things, as I said, sitting is about one met. Light activity would be activity that doesn't change heart rate. So slowly walking, cooking, you know, reading a book, moving the pages is somewhere above one met, but less than three. And that'd be considered a light activity or not something that we're interested in. Moderate activity is something that increases your heart rate, but important to distinguish it from vigorous activity is that you're able to carry on a conversation during this. So this would be walking at a brisk pace, about three miles an hour, mowing the lawn with a push mower, and then vigorous activity is something that's six mets or more per minute. So jogging, cycling uphill, something that's actively prohibiting you from having a conversation. And if you can imagine, again, moderate activity is between three and six mets. So walking three and a half miles an hour, say that's four mets at 150 minutes, is 600 mets. So you've, you know, if you're doing that for 150 minutes a week or 30 minutes, five days a week, you've already met your goal. Yeah, that was very helpful because, yeah, that can be, you know, try, pretty confusing when you know, trying to figure out, okay, exercise is good. How much do I need to do? So thank you for kind of going through that for our listeners. Now, if avoiding low testosterone wasn't enough, you know, kind of ammo, uh, so to speak, could you share some of the other health benefits of meeting the target activity goal of 500 to 1,000, you know, mets per week? Absolutely. So just to clarify, this is a minimum. More is better. A lot of these things haven't been able to be studied in the more category just because we haven't had participants able to do that in a control group. But again, more exercise is better. And the big benefits that we see and the ones that have been studied over and over again are all-cause mortality. So just overall risk of death is lower for people that exercise at least in this minimum threshold, specifically heart disease and stroke, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, dementia, some things that aren't necessarily comorbidity related, but you know, improved quality of life and improved sleep have both been related to having uh, exercise, at least at these minimum thresholds. And then there are specific benefits to different groups. So in the elderly, it's been shown to reduce falls. In pregnant women, it's been shown to decrease the risk of excessive weight gain and gestational diabetes. And then in some groups, specifically the colorectal and uh, breast cancer groups, it's been shown to decrease not only cancer-specific deaths, but also overall deaths. Wow. Well, that's, I mean, this has really been an awesome study, solid gold, highlighting the importance of exercise and its effect on testosterone, but also 
you know, just as you mentioned, all of the other, you know, great benefits that come along with it. I think it will further support some of the more recent American Urologic Association guidelines that all men with low testosterone should be counseled regarding weight loss programs as an initial treatment strategy. So Dr. Fantis, uh, any final thoughts for our listeners today in the podcast? Well, I think that the most important things to me is as an andrologist and a personal trainer is just to empower yourself, take control of your life, you know, diet and exercise are things you can do every day, not only to improve your testosterone, but to improve your health in most ways. And while these modifications aren't a panacea, they can serve in combination with other medications to help you live a longer, healthier, and more fulfilling life. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so Dr. Fantis, it was certainly a joy getting to chat with you today on the Prostate Health Podcast. You've definitely delivered some useful information today for our listeners. So thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you again for listening to the Prostate Health Podcast. We would love to have you join our podcast Facebook group at www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash prostate health podcast, or just use the Facebook group search function and search for the prostate health podcast and ask to join. We'll see you at the next episode.